Hello, I'm Seema and welcome to part 3 of the chapter Metals and Nonmetals. Now that we have studied about the physical properties of metals and nonmetals and we have understood how to classify them and why that is not the perfect way to classify metals and nonmetals, it is now time to start understanding the chemical properties of metals and nonmetals. So the topic of this video is going to be chemical properties of metals and nonmetals and while actually we are only going to study one property that is the reaction of metals with oxygen or the oxidation of metals. So the topic of this video is actually reaction of metals with oxygen. Do you know almost all metals react with oxygen to form their oxides. We say almost all because there are metals which are noble metals like gold and silver which do not react with oxygen. And therefore we say but normally almost all metals react with oxygen and they result in the formation of their metallic oxides. Now when you do these equations you may find it a little difficult to memorize the equations but uh, if you remember what happens if you try to learn it as a story, a little memorization of course is required. But if you think that all metals they are going to be reacting with uh, oxygen to form their oxides except a few, there are always exceptions. Wherever you study chemistry, you are always going to find few who are not going to follow those rules. Isn't that how it is in a classroom? There are some of you who will never follow rules. It's the same with elements. There are some, there would be some who would always be exceptions. Anyway, almost all metals, they form oxides. So what is oxide means? That O, oxygen should be there in the formula. And the metal, whatever the metal is, its formula should be there. The formula for copper is Cu and oxygen is O. It results in the formation of copper 2 oxide. And the formula for that uh, molecule is CuO. You know, copper is present in two, uh, it has two charges. Sometimes it has a charge of one positive and sometimes it has a charge of two positive. And oxygen has a charge of two negative. Now here it is copper two oxide. This you will have to memorize. That it forms copper two oxide. It means the charge of copper is two positive and the charge of oxygen is two negative. Therefore, what would the formula of copper oxide be? It would be CuO. Do you remember in class 9, you used to write down the valencies on top and then crisscross to write down the formula of the compound? So if you know the, react the reactants, which metal is it and oxygen and you know their valencies, you will put the valencies on top, crisscross and you would be able to make the formula of the compound. And after that, you can balance the chemical equation in order to get your equation. But that is a way where you can understand equations and then memorizing them becomes much more easier. But uh, if you do not have the time for that, then you just have to rote learn them. But uh, I would not suggest rote learning equations because whenever you rote learn equations, you tend to uh, forget them also. And you tend to make little mistakes here and there, which gives you a zero mark. You never get score completely. Anyway, it's simple logic, you know, metals combining with oxygen to form oxide. So there'll be a metal atom, there'll be oxygen atom and you, the valencies crisscross and you get the formula that balance the equation. Similarly, aluminum combines with oxygen to form aluminum oxide. And aluminum oxide, what would the formula? The valency of aluminum is 3 positive and oxygen is 2 negative. So 2 negative of, of oxygen will, be, will come here, so it will be Al2 and 3 positive of aluminum will come here, so it will be Al2O3. Now, if you balance the chemical equation, whenever you have 3 and 2, multiply the 3 with, with 2, you get a 6 and that's an easy way. So you get a 6. If you get a 6 here, how many aluminums do you get? 4. So you need 4 aluminums. You balance the equation and you'll get the equation. This is just my suggestion to you that you try to understand equations this way and you will memorize them much easier. Anyway, so uh, the topic here that we are trying to focus on when what is it, what is the main point that we are trying to memorize that whenever metals react with oxygen they result in the formation of their oxides. For example, copper combines with oxygen to form copper 2 oxide, aluminum combines with oxygen to form aluminum oxide. Now what is it about these oxides that we need to understand? Most of these oxides are basic in nature. We had studied in the previous chapter that metals form basic oxides and non-metals they form acidic oxides. And in the previous video also I told you about this. Now copper oxide is a basic oxide and it reacts 
What is a base? A base would be something that reacts with acids to form salt and water. So this basic oxide would react with acids to form salt and water and that's what we observe. Copper oxide combines with hydrochloric acid to form salt. Now if you have copper here and chlorine here, see whenever acids react with bases they result in the formation of salt and water. So remove the water, hydrogen and oxygen and take the positive of this and the negative of this and make a compound. Copper is 2, chlorine has a charge of 1 negative so the formula of copper chloride will be CuCl2. Why? Because the charge of copper is 2 positive, chlorine is 1 negative, crisscross you get Cu. For chlorine 1 you don't write anything, for 2 of copper you write 2 here. And of course water and then balance the equation. Right? So copper oxide is basic. Why? Because it reacts with acids and results in the formation of salt and water. Aluminum oxide is a confused oxide. It's an amphoteric oxide. Now what does amphoteric mean? It's confused. Now you can take it as a joke and call anyone who's confused in the class, oh my god, he's amphoteric. That way you will it'll help you to memorize the term. It's an amphoteric oxide. This guy is amphoteric, you know. Amphoteric is confused. How? Because it forms oxides which when you make it react with an acid, it starts acting like a base. When you make it react with a base, it starts acting like an acid. So it shows those reactions, the neutralization reactions with both acids and bases. Such oxides which are which show both characters. We cannot say that it is neither acidic nor basic. No, it is acidic when it is reacting with bases and it is basic when it is reacting with acids. So aluminum oxide is an example of an amphoteric oxide. Now let us see how does it show the amphoteric behavior. You again have to memorize these equations because the question you will get a question which will ask you what is the amphoteric oxide, what happens when aluminum oxide reacts with uh, an acid or what happens when it reacts with a base. So aluminum oxide when it reacts with hydrochloric acid. Now again aluminum has a charge of 3 positive, chlorine 1 negative. So Al 1 negative will come down here Al and 3 positive of aluminum comes down here, AlCl3. Aluminum chloride will be the salt that will be formed. And of course, water is always formed in neutralization reactions. When it reacts with a base, now it is again acting as an acid when it is reacting with a base. And it will again show the same reaction, neutralization. That is, water will come out. So H2O will come out. We are not to be bothered about that. <coughs> and you will get... Uh, now this one, this equation is a little complex, so you'll have to memorize it because it does not form the, uh, it does not form the negative, it doesn't combine the negative here or this doesn't, it forms a little complex ion. So you get sodium aluminate, this compound is called sodium aluminate and memorize the formula NaAlO2 is the formula of this. But this is also a salt and it results in the formation of water and then you balance the equation. So this was about the chemical reactions with oxygen. Most metal oxides, they are insoluble in water. But if you dissolve them in water, they form, as, uh, they form bases and these bases are called alkalis. All of them, most metallic oxides are basic in nature. But only some of them are soluble in water. Those metallic oxides which are soluble in water, they form alkalis. And alkalis are very strong bases. They are really strong bases. They are so strong, they are very, they are highly corrosive. If, if you burn your skin with an acid, uh, you burn it. But with a base, it can go right up to your bones. It is so corrosive. Alkalis are highly corrosive to the skin. So you have to be very careful when you handle them in the laboratory. Now, how do we know that what, what uh, oxides are soluble in water? And how do they form alkalis? For example, sodium oxide is a reactive oxide. When you dissolve it in water, it dissolves in water and it reacts with the water to form NaOH, sodium hydroxide. It's an aqueous solution. Now, these equations, again, you have to memorize. So sodium oxide combines with water to form sodium hydroxide. Similarly, potassium oxide combines with water to form potassium hydroxide. Now, sodium, potassium, these are alkali metals and they are highly reactive metals. So those metals which are highly reactive, they tend to form oxides also which are highly reactive. And therefore these oxides will dissolve in, in water because they are so reactive and not only just dissolve in water, they will react with the water 
and they will form the hydroxides and these aqueous solutions of these hydroxides they are very strong bases and they are called alkalis. Now that we have stu studied about a few chemical equations which are about formation of oxides, let us see uh, carry out a practical uh, example or a, a practical exercise in the laboratory. We take different metals and we try to burn them. And when we try to burn them, like if we take an iron, a little uh, wire of iron, we could take a little zinc um, powder, we could take some iron filings uh, or um, an iron piece, and uh, then we could take uh, some magnesium ribbon, we could take a little lead, we may have a lead piece here or there, and potassium and sodium, they are also available in the laboratory. Now, if you burn these metals, what do you see? That potassium and sodium, they violently react. If you bring them to a flame, they just burst into flames. They violently react with uh, oxygen. And when you bring it to a flame, what is burning? Burning is nothing but reaction of a substance with oxygen. And uh, since it is a highly exothermic reaction, it gives out a lot of heat, it gives out flames also. So when you bring potassium and sodium, they burn violently. And they burn so easily that even if you leave them out in the open, they may just simply catch fire if the temperature is high. Because they may react with the oxygen of the atmosphere and simply catch fire. So, in the laboratory, sodium and potassium are not kept just in a bottle, you know. Like you would have metals or just leave a metal piece out in the open. They have to be kept immersed in kerosene oil so that it doesn't come in direct contact with oxygen and it doesn't burn on its own spontaneously. Iron, if you take a piece of iron and you try to burn it in the flame, it does not burn at all, you notice. But if you take iron filings, iron filings are nothing but scrapings of iron, you know, in industries when they, uh, they are making something of iron and little scrapings that come off, they are known as the iron filings. These iron filings, if you put them into a flame, they do burn. But iron, a bigger block or a bigger piece of iron would not burn. It is only when it is scrapped off very nicely, it is that uh, little scrapings of iron which might burn. Then we notice that copper, even if we take scrapings of copper, it does not burn in oxygen. It, it does not catch flames at all. It does not burn. Rather, it changes its color. It becomes a little dull. So we say it acquires a coating of copper oxide. It does react, but not so violently that it would go up in flames. The reaction does take place, but it is a much slower reaction. So what do we observe from this activity? That metals, when we said that almost all metals react with oxygen, they do react with oxygen, but the, the speed with which, or the rate with which they may react with oxygen varies depending on the reactivity of the metal. Some metals are more reactive, some metals are less reactive. So that reactivity, how reactive would it be, would depend on, uh, would decide what kind of a reaction would it have with oxygen. Then silver and gold, they do not react with oxygen at all. You keep burning them, you keep heating them in a flame, nothing happens. They may melt, but they are not going to react with oxygen. They are not going to form uh, even a coating of oxygen. Now there's one, just as copper I told you, if you burn it, it does not burn, but it acquires a coating of oxide, uh, copper oxide on its outer surface. A similar behavior is seen by metals like magnesium, aluminum, zinc and lead. These are moderately reactive metals. So they will not burn, they will not uh, catch fire, but they will acquire a coating, a thin coating of the oxide of the same metal on the surface. And do you know this thin coating of metal on the surface, it, it, it is like paint, it covers the metal completely. The outer surface of the metal, it acquires that coating, it turns into the oxide and that oxide it stays stuck to the metal and it does not move from there and it, the coating does not allow it to come in contact with more oxygen. The inner metal is now being is now protected, is now being insulated by the outer layer of oxide and now no longer can it react with the oxygen because the, more, the atoms of the metal are inside. Since they cannot react, what happens? The outer layer starts acting as a protective layer. And this knowledge was used to carry out a process which is known as anodizing. Aluminum metal gets oxidized easily. 
and uh, therefore if you take aluminum and you deliberately oxidize um, create a layer of uh, outer aluminum oxide and you deliberately make a little thicker layer so that the inner metal simply cannot come in contact with the atmosphere and cannot react more with the oxygen and it remains intact that is done uh, artificially and why is it done artificially it is done artificially so that the layer of oxide protects the inner metal from getting uh, oxidized this process is known as anodizing the pro and uh, it is actually an oxidation process but why do we call it anodizing there is a process called electrolysis you know where we take two rods metallic rods in a beaker in a solution and these, when we pass electric current through these rods and the solution which is present inside it is an acid, a base or a salt, it has something which conducts electricity in it. So we find that it starts forming, a reaction takes place inside that and the reaction of that substance causes, the, uh, causes certain uh, substances to deposit on the electrodes, that is the metallic rods, they are known as electrodes. The positive rod is known as the anode and the negative rod is known as the cathode. So what, why do we call it anodizing? For example, if I'm anodizing aluminum, I take aluminum and I make it the anode. And I take sulfuric acid in the tank and the cathode may be any other metal and I pass electric current through it. The sulfuric acid, it starts breaking down the molecules and the oxygen of the sulfuric acid is negative. And anode I told you is positive. So the negative oxygen goes to the anode, it reacts with the anode and it forms aluminum and the anode is aluminum. So it forms aluminum oxide and as soon as aluminum oxide is formed, what did I tell you? It is the surface atoms on the surface which react with oxygen, whether it is atmosphere or inside the uh, electrolytic tank. In the atmosphere, this is a slow process. It may take years to happen. But when you're carrying it out deliberately in the uh, industry and you're carrying it out in the tank chemically, the process occurs much faster. And therefore, a thick layer of aluminum oxide is produced and that coats the uh, aluminum object which you had turned into an anode and you have anodized it. So what is anodizing? Anodizing is the process by which we create, we prepare a coating of the metallic oxide on its surface by making it the anode in an electrolytic process. And why do we do this? We do it to protect the inner metal from being corroded or from being, from being oxidized or from, being, uh, for, from reacting with the atmospheric gases. Now this anodized coating of aluminum, it is very stable and it can easily be painted and therefore aluminum objects which can be, aluminum can be made chemically very inert by protecting it with the, uh, with the aluminum oxide and then painting it with beautiful colors to give you nice aluminum objects. So well, this was the reaction of metals with oxygen. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel, recommend it to your friends and please keep returning for more videos in chemistry. Thank you for watching and bye bye for now.